So tonight, after being a closeted atheist in the pulpit for many years in the Bible Belt, Adam Mann just is, is going to come out here publicly as an atheist. He just left the ministry recently. So when you get to know him, um, make him feel welcome. Make him feel welcome. His first visit to a, a place of a bunch of godless heathens like you. Uh, <laughs> let him know what true uh, heathen fellowship is all about. So I, I'm going to let him tell you his real name tonight. So Adam, man, can you come up and then I can start calling you by your real name. Where are you? Here. Wow. Eight years ago, I did not even know what a free thought convention was. <laughs> Seriously. Let alone ever dreamed that I would be speaking at one. Thank you in advance for hearing my story. My story, while unique with my own personal situation and experiences, unfortunately is not unique across the country, or we found out even around the world, because of others who have found them, found themselves trapped by the disheartening position of being a member of the clergy who all of a sudden finds themselves no longer believing in a God or the supernatural. So it's my hope that my story will bring hope to those that find themselves in that perplexing situation. Who am I? For eight years, I was known as Adam Mann. I told Linda before I would be walking in the mall and I would hear someone say Adam and I would turn, <laughs> but never say anything. My real name is Carter Warden. Um, I was born in 1963. I was born an agnostic because I could not prove anything, but I was open to everything. I've lived in East Tennessee since I was four years old. So if you can't understand everything that I say, hopefully this will be in a written form later. <laughs> What's the spiritual climate of East Tennessee, you might ask? Last year, the Tri-Cities, Tennessee, was named the third most Bible-minded city in the United States by the American Bible Society and the Barna Group, only behind Birmingham, Alabama, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Participants are considered Bible-minded if they have read the Bible at least once in the previous week and they have a literal interpretation of Scripture. That's where I live. My early religious upbringing was United Methodist, but then as a teenager and then a young adult, I, trans I transitioned into the Christian church, Church of Christ, uh, which was the instrumental version because there is a non-instrumental version of the Church of Christ because we know how segmented the faithful can be sometimes. So I was born smack dab in the middle of American Protestantism. Why did I become a pastor? Originally, I was an automotive technician by trade with a two-year associate degree. I was always very mechanically minded. Things are very black and white to me. They either worked or they didn't. There's always a logical reason and a corresponding repair. But after a few years of work and deepening involvement in my local church, I sought a more meaningful purpose for my life. And religion did offer that for me at that time. I had married my high school sweetheart uh, in fact, we just celebrated our 33rd anniversary. We have two grown children. But early on, my wife and I decided that our lives and our marriage even would be dedicated to ministry. So I went back to school and received an undergraduate degree as a Bible major, sociology minor from a local Christian liberal arts college. I was ordained into ministry in 1988 and I began preaching in a local church. The Christian Church, Church of Christ, does not require that its pastors attend seminary, but I wanted more education. So I went back and uh, obtained a Master of Arts in Religion. So for well over 25 years, I was active in ministry as either a youth pastor, preaching pastor, small groups pastor, uh, administrative pastor of a large church, and also a worship pastor. And then most recently, 
all that was in the Christian church. And until recently, matter of fact, two weeks ago, I was a part-time musician and worship leader for a local United Methodist church. By the way, I am looking for work I can do from home or on the weekends now. <laughs> this might shock you, but my church experiences were all pleasant. Every one of them. No horror stories. No feuds with congregations or with church leaders. Matter of fact, today my lifelong friends are all in the church. Church members have shown concern and care for my family during some very difficult times. And for that, I will always be grateful. So what changed? My spiritual demise, as some would say, what I like to call my intellectual enlightenment, began in July of 2008 after nearly 20 years in full-time ministry. I was leading a small group Bible study and we were studying this book called Unchristian. It is written by Christians, by the Barna Research Group. But we were studying that as a small group experience. And the book tried to look at the way the world views Christians and it focused on the mosaics and the busters, the 19 to 29 year olds, you know, the group that the church always loses when they go off to college and they never come back. The, the research in this book represented the six, top six criticisms that non-Christians have about Christians. And here's the summary of it. Christians are one, hypocritical, two, anti-homosexual, three, sheltered, four, conversion motivated, five, too political, and six, judgmental. I would say they hit it pretty well on the head, wouldn't you? <laughs> but I began to look at the big picture and I took it serious. I tried to step back and see what we Christians look like from a non-believer's perspective. And as I seriously thought about it, I realized one day, I remember I was driving and we had just studied that chapter in the book and I thought on being sheltered. And I thought, if a non-believer approached me and tried to start a conversation about evolution, for example, there's no way I could even carry on an intelligent conversation. This was because most fundamental evangelical believers have shunned all secular and scientific teaching about evolution because it's taught by the church to be evil and it directly contradicts the literal interpretation of scripture. So I realized that book's right. The indictment of the non-Christians was correct. I was sheltered and I was ignorant about many things. So the book challenged me to do research on my own so that I might know my secular audience you, so that I could win you to Christ. So I began reading anything and everything on the topics of evolution, biology, cosmology, cognitive science, philosophy, world religions, and eventually I found myself secretly reading the books and watching debates by the four horsemen of the new atheism, Dawkins, Dennett, Hitchens, and Harris. I read books by Bart Ehrman, Dan Barker, Michael Shermer, Guy Harrison, Greg Epstein, John Loftus, Stephen Hawking, Stephen Prothero, Eugenie Scott, Victor Stinger, Jerry Coyne, Andrew Newberg, Ian Hershey Ali, as well as the writings of Bertrand Russell, Friedrich Nietzsche, Robert Ingersoll, Charles Darwin, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Paine, to name a few. But you see, I knew that if Christianity were true, that it wouldn't matter what I was studying. Surely God could and would honor my sincere inquiry into the big questions of life and faith. Surely searching for understanding and truth would even draw me closer to him. I had always said a faith unchallenged is really not faith at all. And I always loved to quote Francis Schaeffer at the time who stated, for faith to have a conviction of a whole person, it must be based upon the mind as well as the heart. So I thought, okay. I found myself continuing to plunge into areas of study I'd never seriously contemplated. So between July 2008 and April 2009, I read over 60 books, listened to hundreds of hours of lectures and debates. I watched 25 documentaries and movies. I went through eight college level courses from the teaching company on philosophy, evolution, New Testament, world religions, biology, and human behavior. And although I had over 20 years of Christian teaching and doctrine as a foundation, I tried to balance my study so I wouldn't be swayed by one stream of ideology. Therefore, I read both Christian writers as well as non-believers. My complete study list, if you would happen to be interested, is found on Linda Lascola's Rational Doubt Pathos blog under the media tab. All 33 pages of it, I believe. 
I also audited a graduate level class on the historical life of Christ to see what the most recent scholarship had to offer in an attempt to, to recover my waning faith. But the class only solidified my skepticism by showing how little we can really know about the life of Christ as recorded in the New Testament and its outside sources and the plethora of variations and inconsistencies and contradictions in the text. But realizing I wasn't the first person to wrestle with doubt, I sought the uh, advice of some people that I respected that I knew I could trust. So over a period of almost one year, I met with four different Bible college and seminary professors, three pastors, and even a professional Christian counselor whose official diagnosis was, you have a conflict of careers. <laughs> now, while I respect each of these people, none of them had satisfactory answers. In fact, most of them, the majority, said that I needed to leave fundamentalism and move and minister in a more liberal denomination. They told me that I was interpreting the text too literally. And while this solution might and does work for some, I saw it as avoiding the ultimate question. Is there really an all-knowing, all-powerful, loving, intervening God as revealed in Scripture? Tell me, is there? Okay. <laughs> that was good response. My conclusion after 10 months of intense study and following study, uh, and still to this day is, no, there is not. You are correct. <laughs> so instead of deepening my faith, my intense study left me no choice but to abandon my once precious faith. I did not lose my faith as though it was something that regrettably slipped away. Rather, I chose to discard it because it no longer made sense to me. Some of the major reasons I no longer believe in summary are the contradictions in the biblical text, the discrepant, not only discrepant, but the despicable character of God in Scripture, the questions of theodicy, suffering in the world, the fallacies of answered prayer, the denial of modern science, and the harmful teachings of religion in general. I agree with Dan Dennett, who in the book Caught in the Pulpit, who by the way quotes some very good people, um, that the church has its hands full if it seeks to protect its lay people and even its religious leaders from the influences of the real world, end quote. Modern technology makes information readily available for anyone seeking answers. And therefore the church today faces the same dilemma that God himself fictitiously faced rather unsuccessfully in the Garden of Eden when he tried to keep mankind from that tree of knowledge. Shouldn't that be a red flag to people? <laughs> Shouldn't that be a warning sign? Shouldn't that be a warning sign when open, honest inquiry is discouraged and even squelched? Faith and knowledge do not go hand in hand. To me, they're more like oil and water. Yes, you can temporarily mix them if you constantly and vigorously shake it and work at it, but when it's left alone in its natural state, they repel each other. So what is a non-believing clergy member to do? Dan shared that on the, the day after Easter Sunday in 2009, I gathered up the nerve and I looked up the phone number to the Freedom From Religion Foundation and I called and I asked to speak with Dan Barker and I was surprised. Dan Barker got on the phone. He answered the phone. I was sitting in my church parking lot. Dan doesn't know this, but I had blocked my number on my cell phone just in case this unknown atheist tried to turn me in to the church authorities <laughs> or to a news agency. I had read his book, Godless. Um, which was a fairly new book at that time, and I just had to speak with somebody who had experienced what I was going through. I told Dan my entire life had been given to God. My wife and my children and my extended family were all very strong Christians. Our lives revolved around the church. And Dan, you know what it's like? We were consumed by Christianity. It was everywhere in our lives. It was incredible when I talked to Dan. And he spent a long time talking with me on the phone. It was incredible to find someone who understood, someone who had once been passionate about God and ministry in the church, but has also changed his mind. Allow me to read part of my email the next day to Dan and note the fear of being identified, which we found out all non-believing clergy have, at least at the beginning. Dan, I really appreciate you taking my call yesterday. I'm writing under the fictitious name I've created and a fictitious email account just for such correspondence. 
I'm interested in you putting me in touch with the person doing the interviews for the Daniel Dennett Project. Again, I want to emphasize the need for confidentiality with you and your organization, as well as with the Dennett Project. I know you'll understand this. So I give you permission to give my email to the Dennett contact person. Sorry, I cannot remember her name, Adam. Thus the beginning of Adam Mann and the first of over 2,500 emails with Linda Lascola, whose name I will never forget. So in 2009, I became one of the uh, first active clergy members in the pilot study of the original Tufts uh, by Dan and Linda. After that, Linda and Dan orchestrated secret interviews with ABC's Dan Harris and with the Canadian Broadcasting Company, and I was eager to participate in those. So since Linda has always shared about kind of what I did as a, a secret founder and a website technical administrator and a forum moderator, I just want to share what I learned about being a member of the Clergy Project, about myself and the now nearly 770 Clergy Project members. I learned that I'm not alone. Yes, that's... I learned that I'm not alone. I learned that reason and science are the best tools for people to discover truth, freedom, happiness, and purpose in this life. I learned that goodness and morality do not come from a God. Goodness, morality, <laughs> happiness, compassion, love, self-sacrifice, and a desire to make this world a better place can be found within each one of us in our minds when we accept the role as the most evolved and most privileged species on earth. I saw this firsthand in March of 2013 when a former Catholic priest who was a member of the clergy project shared on the private forum that he had just been diagnosed with inoperable liver cancer. Roger's amazing positive attitude and willingness to share his pain and resolve with almost complete strangers was a very powerful testimony that there truly are atheists in foxholes and that death without the hope of something beyond is not only fathomable, but it can be viewed as a welcome experience in this journey of life. Roger and I exchanged emails and spoke on the phone as he awaited his imminent death. I actually interviewed Roger for over an hour by Skype on one weekend, and he gave me permission when I had the time to edit and eventually share that video that we titled The Acid Test of Final Farewells, which was the title of his post on the clergy project. In fact, Linda and I hope to share that story on her video blog, I mean, on her video, uh, that video soon on her blog. Interviewing Roger, he'd told me how inspiring the work of Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett had been at one time in his life. And I just wanted to do something for Roger. So I wrote Dan Dennett and shared Roger's story and gave Dan Dennett Roger's phone number. And I left it at that. One day later, Roger wrote me and said, Adam, if you did anything to facilitate the call I just received, I thank you from the depths of my heart. It was a very heartwarming surprise and damn near midnight his time. I had often watched him as one of the four horsemen, one of the pure essences of the goodness of this universe. Roger died peacefully at his home less than two weeks after my interview and Dan's call. Peace, compassion, purpose, all exhibited in the lives of those who are not believers. Truly a real testimony of goodliness without godliness. So why go public now? You've, uh, you've hidden your identity for eight years. Can't you keep it up? Who would want to? While doing one interview for the clergy project, I was asked what fears I had. And my answer was, my greatest fear is doing nothing at all and pretending to be someone that I'm not for the rest of my life. You see, all of us non-believing clergy have our own reasons for remaining closeted when we do. Many like me refrain from telling others because we don't want to hurt or embarrass family members or friends. Combine that with the financial stress of trying to change a career in midstream. And you can see why many learn to tough it out and put up with the, the cognitive dissonance and the gut-wrenching feeling of inauthenticity. Yet I longed for the day when I could be completely honest and transparent about the journey from faith to reason, especially with those that I love the most. 
In 2013, I realized I had to give up some of my responsibilities with the clergy project so I could truly focus on changing careers. Thankfully, I did find a good job at a local university, and I quietly, as I called it, oozed out of ministry. <laughs> but because of the financial needs of my family, even though I wasn't working full-time in the church anymore, I was a part-time music minister. Maybe I should have been happy with the way things were, because who knew the difference? God didn't, evidently, right? <laughs> what the people don't know won't hurt them, right? And I really did a try. For almost two years, I, I tried to see if I could live under the radar. I logged off of the clergy project. I gave up my responsibilities as website administrator and as a forum moderator. And I just logged off. I stopped reading about and corresponding with anybody from any of the free thought organizations. I even stopped emailing Linda and Dan Barker and Dan Dennett for an extended period of time. Maybe I could learn to live with the tension. And I did for a little while but I still ultimately had to live with myself. During that time period, I attended several funerals. In fact, I sang at many of them for family and for friends. And each time I found myself barely being able to set through the service. And I was thinking, what will they say about me when I die? I don't believe this that I'm seeing. I don't want a Christian funeral, but guess what? That's what I'm gonna have because nobody knows any different. I would think, I don't want to be remembered as a spiritual person. I'm no longer a man of faith. I'm a man of reason. I'm a man who trusts science. I want to enjoy this one short life that I have. I want people to know that I rejected faith and lived a meaningful, happy life without it. I told that to my daughter one day, and she replied, Dad, it won't matter when you're dead. Why don't you tell people now? In his 2005 Stanford, uh, Stanford commencement address, Steve Jobs said, Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And his now haunting words have impacted me tremendously because I have been trapped by dogma and other people's thinking. My true voice has been suppressed and silenced. And as a result, I've been living a life of secrecy, duplicity, and hypocrisy. But that stops today. I don't know. I don't know what the future, don't know what the future holds for me. I don't know exactly how my wife or my extended family will react or how I'll be treated in my community. Thank you. If they, if they fault me for being honest, then so be it. Robert Frost in an interview once said, freedom lies in being bold. And I ask myself and I ask you, can we ever be free without being bold? So while I have been freed from faith and belief in my mind for several years now, for me, the celebration of true independence comes literally today. It comes right now. Now as I finally find the boldness to openly proclaim to the world that I'm no longer a member of the clergy or a person of faith, I live with reason as my guide, and I am an atheist. While I like to talk, I love to sing. So I'm gonna sing a song to you that I wrote in 2011. I remember recording it and sending it to Linda and Dan. And I said, I was just trying to capture what it felt like while I was two years out from, from giving up on God. But I remember that confusion and that betrayal that I still felt as if he were real. And so I tried to capture that in a song. So, but also to express the excitement and the freedom that I would hopefully one day enjoy. So I'm going to sing it for you now before anyone for the first time ever. So.
called Life After You. And uh, bear with me during the first part of the song because I'm singing it to a, uh, a God that's not there. Okay. I was searching for the truth. I thought I knew it. I thought it was you. You were my best friend I never thought this could come to an end Whoa, whoa, never end You were my source of strength My solid rock, my hiding place If everyone deserted me You'd stand beside me Never leave, oh, oh, never leave. Now I'm here all alone, so empty. Now that you're gone, so I'm crying while I'm trying to pick up the pieces that you left. And I'm wondering And I'm waiting To see what comes of my new life Life after you Oh, after you Looking back on all I went through I know I thought too highly of you But now I know you can never be Something you're not And that has set me free Oh, 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 oh set me free It's okay that I'm here all alone Life has more meaning now that you're gone So I'm yearning And I'm learning To think for myself And live what I believe And I'm searching And I'm finding That reason alone had the power to set me free well, I said reason alone had the power to set me free. Oh, set me free. Whoa, I'm free. I am free. Thank you. <laughs> We've got one more little surprise for you. Uh, we mentioned that... Uh, that over the internet, having never met one another, uh, we collaborated on uh, what I think has been titled uh, Liberating Hymns, right? So we're going to do one of those for you just now. Uh, I sent Dan a bunch of music and I said, I've got some ideas. I'd like to rewrite some of the words to some of the hymns that he and I both knew so well for so many years. And so we picked one we're going to do for you tonight, and it's called The Solid Rock. Uh, if, you were, if you were in the church and you knew it, the chorus went, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. The new title of this song is called, The Solid Rock of Science. Mm -hmm. 
My hope is built on nothing less than facts learned from hypothesis. I dare not trust the sweetest myth, but wholly trust in science. On science the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When problems rear their ugly face, I trust minds of the human race. When all around my soul gives way, knowledge is my true hope today. On science the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When we are sick and prayers all fail, medicine can cure our ails. I do not trust in God's good grace. Real hope is found in science. On science, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Religion is corrosive to science. It teaches people to be satisfied with trivial, supernatural non-explanations and blinds them to the wonderful real explanations that we have within our grasp. It teaches them to accept authority, revelation and faith instead of always insisting on evidence. One day I hope all men will see Religions harm humanity The greatest tools for our ascent Education and enlightenment Sing with us! On science the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is 